Uh, my name is. Oh, got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome everybody, and um, thank you for uh, attending. We know that there there is some problems uh, with power, so there are people who did register but maybe couldn't make it. But as I mentioned, we're recording this, so it will be linked to our website, uh, Bristol Community College um, Holocaust and Genocide Center. So those of you, if you know people who wanted to see it, they can see it there or even let me know and we could send them a, a link. Um, but, uh, or you wanna see it again, because sometimes it <laughs> takes more than once to really understand things. Anyway, I uh, wanna welcome you. This is our second in program of our semester. My name is uh, Ron Weisberger. I'm the director of Holocaust and Genocide Center. Um, we are uh, a center of Bristol Community College only one of, I like to say, only one of three in the state. Uh, and we do programming uh, such as the one we're doing today. We also uh, been working with regional teachers and students in high school and middle school. Uh, we have a really exciting project. Uh, they've been working with our advisory committee, uh, Gary Brown and Marsha Onervik to distribute uh, a trunk, which, uh, which has a lot of material in it that uh, we put in libraries in schools and then uh, teachers can come and utilize that material in their uh, courses and curriculum so that's a, a really an exciting project uh, we're going to be continuing we hope to have a a um, maybe a one credit course this summer from leslie university that faculty uh, teachers can take um, and we do have a we have one more program which will be an interesting, a little bit different one than what we've done. It's a video called Passage, Passage to Sweden, which deals with the role of the uh, Scandinavian, particularly Swedes, in, in helping to save uh, many uh, Jewish Jews who were you know, subject to the Holocaust, particularly in, in, Sweden, in uh, Hungary, which was the last country to, of which the Jews were rounded up. And um, Susan Warnock is the director so the video will be available between November 14th and November 18th for you, any of you interested to view. And then Susan, Susanna will be available on the 18th at four o'clock to uh, talk, to give a talk about the video and ask her questions or whatever. So in this case, you can watch the video beforehand and then uh, talk with the director. And it's actually, it's won a number of awards around the, uh, around the world. So it's a, uh, quite good and uh, we're again fortunate to have it so that's going to be our last one of this semester we will have other ones in the uh in the spring and you'll hear about that so anyway uh, but we're real excited uh to have um this project <laughs> this program uh, by uh, pauline gotsoyan right? i don't know if i got that right um who um is going to be talking about the armenian genocide and as i've said we are a little bit late you know it's a very important uh genocide to know about you know we did one on native americans we did one on on the uh, cambodian genocide and others and uh, i'm really pleased to have pauline here to talk about the armenian genocide which as many of you or some of you may know preceded the holocaust and uh, in some ways set the ground for it but in and of itself it was a horrendous event so we'll be learning more about it so let me quickly and uh, introduce Pauline and then turn it over to her. So Pauline is the editor of the Armenian Weekly Newspaper, uh, which is a national newspaper headquartered in Watertown, Massachusetts. And she's an active member of the Rhode Island Armenian community. She's a longtime advocate for genocide education through her work with the Armenian National Committee of Rhode Island. She's also a charter member serving on the Rhode Island Holocaust and Genocide Education Com Coalition, which I've been involved with. And I know Howard Timberg, who's here, has also been involved with a really uh, great group. Uh, you know, R Rhode Island, just quickly, Rhode Island uh, passed a mandate two years ago to mandate the teaching of the Holocaust in the schools. And now this past year, they uh, legislation created a Holocaust commission, which is really exciting. And I'm sad to say that Massachusetts has not done that yet. There is something in the legislature which hopefully will pass this session uh, called the Genocide Education Act. And 
As a matter of fact, if you want to contact your local, it passed the Senate. So if you if you um, contact your local representative and urge them to pass it and then send it to Governor Baker, that would be great because we're really behind. There's about 10, 12 states that have passed mandates and Massachusetts is behind, but Rhode Island <laughs> has done it. And this commission has been very important in making that happen. So thank you for that. Okay, so in addition to that, Pauline has been is an adjunct professor of developmental reading and writing in the English department at the Community College of Rhode Island. And uh, she's been there since 2008. In addition to her educational and media work, she's not busy enough. She's involved in phil philanthropic endeavors, including working with the Armenian Relief Society as a uh, uh, organization, which is an organization, both state and, and national. And she's been both involved on the executive levels in both state and, and national. So all of all that, we know that we're going to learn a lot from Pauline. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ron. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for having me. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. And I'm actually very honored to be sort of the, uh, the first presenter on the Armenian Genocide for the organization, for the group. Um, so I'll outline just a little bit the way um, I'm, I've planned the presentation with plenty of room at the end for um, questions, uh, if anybody has any. Um, but I'm going to offer an historical overview to begin with. I have a PowerPoint that I'll be sharing shortly. Um, and then I'm going to show a very brief um, educational film that uh, I was involved in um, in actually developing along with my colleague on the uh, Rhode, in the Rhode Island branch of the Genocide Education Project, my co-chair uh, with who I've worked with for many, many years is Esther Kalajan. And uh, she and I were able to uh, get a grant through the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities for this film that you'll see. It's actually very appropriate to use in classrooms as well. So um, it's it, available on uh, online through YouTube and you'll see that shortly. And then I'm also gonna share a little bit more about my own survivor's story. Um, my grandparents survived the Armenian genocide. My grandmother uh, was the one who I had the longest and uh, she actually lived with us. So I, I, we know uh, the most about her story out of everybody's uh, because of the, the fact that we had her till she was 95, thankfully. Um, so that's going to be the way things go. Then you'll be able to ask questions. Believe me, it will go much more quickly than my introduction to it went. <laughs> so, um, but you'll have plenty of time to ask questions. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully get the presentation up. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see here. All right. So can you see the slide okay? Um, it should say the Armenian Genocide. Okay, so the photograph that you're seeing here is of the Armenian Genocide um, Memorial in Yerevan, Armenia, in the capital of Armenia. And um, the quote is from Henry Morgenthau, who served as the American ambassador to the Ottoman Empire during the First World War, 1913 to 1916. And he witnessed the Armenian Genocide firsthand, wrote a book about it. Um, and he said, I am confident that the whole history of the human race contains no such horrible episode as this. The great massacres and persecutions of the past seem almost insignificant when compared with the sufferings of the Armenian race in 1915. I think that's a very telling quote. Um, so when did it happen? It happened during the First World War, 1915 to 1918 were the primary years that the Armenian Genocide happened with additional massacres continuing until 1923. This map actually shows the plan of the death marches. Um, it's a very well-known uh, map actually used frequently if for educational purposes and just in general so people understand where it happened in the world. I don't know, if, I don't think you're going to be able to see my pointer, but this is where Armenia is, the way, where the Ottoman Empire was. And when you look at this screen, the big red splotches, the big circles, even the little circles, 
that's where massacres actually happened. Um, and you will notice that the lines are the death march routes that were planned. You will notice also that many of them lead to the water because people were led to their deaths in the sea and others in um, the desert. At the, many of the marches left here. This was a huge site here in Dejlord. Um, this entire area here in the shaded green, I guess it looks a little bit greenish, was Armenia um, prior to the genocide. And what you see in this pink area here is all that's left of Armenia now, okay? Just to give you a sense of all that was lost during the genocide. Okay, so this was Sultan um, Abdul Hamid. In the late 1890s, about 2 million Armenians lived in Turkey. It was a very multi-ethnic, multi-racial um, uh, empire at that time. Um, it was also in a period of decline at that time. The, this Sultan in the late 1890s sort of um, had a precursor to the Armenian genocide by ordering the massacres of hundreds of thousands of Armenians, even at that time in the late 1890s. Um, so the Ottoman Empire in the late 1890s, early... <laughs> thank you. Okay. I think maybe some people might still need to be muted, but thank you. Thank you for taking care of that because it was bringing. Um, anyway, uh, so the Ottoman Empire was in a period of great decline. Um, at that time, uh, the Ar Armenians, Arabs, Greeks, Jews, and Kurds had begun working with a group of Turks to challenge the authority of this Sultan um, who was being uh, blamed for the, the decline of the empire. And they formed a group called um, the Young Turks. They were the Ot Ottoman liberals and it was the Turkish coalition of the group adopted the name the Young Turks. Um, and in 1908, one of those groups, the Committee of Union and Progress, known as the CUP, marched on Constantinople and overthrew the Sultan. Um, after 1909, there was an extreme nationalist movement um, promoting a, a policy of Turkification, um, and it gained a lot of support uh, from Turkish populations throughout the empire. Um, also at this time, the Ottoman Empire became known as the sick man of Europe at that time. It was weakened by the loss of its lands um, in Southeastern Europe in the Balkan Wars of 1912 to 1913, and then it was badly defeated by Russia in a campaign in the winter of 1914 to 1915. And if you'll remember, the Armenian Genocide began in 1915 in earnest. Um, Armenians, the Armenian population was uh, split between the population in Turkey and the population in Russia. Um, as such, Armenians in Turkey uh, joined the Turkish military and fought on the Turkish side. Armenians in Russia understand understandably joined the Russian army and served um, in Russia. And so they were sort of scapegoats at that time. Um, so the Young Turks and the Committee of Union and Progress um, were led by a triumvirate of Mehmet Talat, Ismail Enver, and Ahmed Jemal. Um, by the spring of 1915, these leaders uh, seized the opportunity of a world preoccupied by war to erase the Armenian presence from almost all Ottoman lands. Um, and I think that that um, situation of using a world preoccupied by war should be familiar to many people, um, or a world preoccupied by a pandemic, or a world preoccupied in some major way through catastrophe and typically war, genocide will happen. This was the plan. Um, the plan was to exterminate all the Armenian people, um, in the Ottoman Empire, a secret group was formed by the Young, young Turks called the Special or Organization, which should also sound somewhat eerily familiar, whose ultimate function was to carry out the extermination of the Armenians. And on April 24th, 1915, 
Armenian civil leaders, intellectuals, doctors, businessmen, and artists were rounded up and killed. This is an image, an actual image from some of that that happened. Um, once these leaders were killed, then the, most, the genocidal plan was uh, put into motion in earnest throughout the empire, and many men were quickly executed. That was actually um, a major part of the plan, liquidate the men first, and then the women um, and children. Uh, so this is a telegram that was intercepted by the allies. Remember, this was happening during the First World War. Um, the telegram said, it has been previously communicated that the government by the order of the assembly has decided to exterminate entirely all the Armenians living in Turkey. Those who oppose this order can no longer function as part of the government without regard to women, children, and invalids, however tragic may be the means of transportation, an end must be put to their existence. And that telegram was from Talat on May 15th, 1915. Um, the image down on the left here is of an actual death march um, that was taking place at that time, all the people rounded up. And the image of the woman on the right is um, relatively iconic. You can see she's actually carrying on her back um, whatever she could carry on the death marches and including her child and her face shows the beginnings of um, starvation. Um, obviously there was the intent to destroy. Um, this is another iconic image of uh, a death march. By 1918, most of the Armenians who resided um, in this land were dead or in the diaspora. Um, by 1923, a 3,000 year old civilization virtually ceased to exist. One and a half million Armenians, more than two thirds of the Armenian population on its historic homeland were dead. Just as a um, reference back, there were about two million Armenians living in uh, Turkey at the time that the genocide began. Um, and at that time also, obviously from the the, uh, the people being sent on death marches, Armenian community property was stolen, appropriated by the government, destroyed anything. And that destruction continues to this day, as a matter of fact. Um, okay, so to the definition of genocide. Um, the definition of genocide came from Raphael Lemkin who uh, coined the word, actually um, had uh, witnessed what was happening during the Armenian genocide was um, very affected by it. Um, at the time that the genocide happened, there was no term to describe this crime, this horrific crime against humanity. And um, they, that's pretty much what it was called, massacres, crimes against humanity, those types of terms. Um, until Mr. Lemkin came along and he worked tirelessly to have genocide recognized as an international crime. And um, when the UN had the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, this is the definition um, according to their resolution, Article 2. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, um, part of which my family has experience with. So um, Israel Charney in his Encyclopedia of Genocide states that denial is the final stage of genocide. And it is the final stage of every genocide, just about, if not all. Um, he also identifies 10 stages of genocide, which are not um, exclusive and, and certainly not linear in nature, um, but they are recognizable um, for genocidal acts. And you can, you can see, you can read about them um, 
uh, Gregory Stanton has talked about them. Um, classification, division into us and them, symbolization, forced to identify themselves in some way. Um, obviously, we know that from the Holocaust, the same happened with Armenians. Um, discrimination, dehumanization. Um, Armenians were typically referred to as uh, dogs or uh, animals of some kind, vermin. Um, then there's the organization part of it. Uh, the, uh, the Turkish government, obviously the uh, CUP, the leaders um, had a plan, they organized and they polarized the groups, divided the populace, prepared them to relocate relocate for their own safety, which is what they were told. They were being moved to a safer location because of the war. Persecution, which uh, sort of began under the Sultan and then continued thereafter. And then of course, extermination. Um, it is called extermination instead of murder because the people are not considered human in the case of genocide. And then denial and the government continues to deny. So at the time of the Armenian genocide, the New York Times um, carried many, many, many articles about the Armenian genocide and what was happening in uh, the Ottoman Empire in Turkey at that time. Uh, and there's a, an entire bound volume that the Genocide Education Project has available. But if you go searching um, on their website, actually, it's not that difficult to find. You can find many of the articles um, that were in the New York Times at that time. It was recognized Near East Relief um, raised funds to uh, take to help the Armenians who were being persecuted. Um, and there was a great drive for the orphans of Armenia, of which there were many. Um, and it was recognized as a crime against humanity. Again, the word genocide did not um, exist at that time. There were some post-World War I trials of the perpetrators, but no formal actions were ultimately taken against the Ottoman Empire. Um, the perpetrators uh, fled to other countries and were allowed to flee to other countries. Um, and no restitution to the Armenian people has been made to this day. In fact, the Turkish government of today continues to deny the genocide ever happened. Um, and that is ongoing under the current president of Turkey. So denial occurs both during and after genocide. It's not happening. It never happened. Um, continuing denial triples the probability of further genocide. And um, actually, there is a connection to what's happening um, with Armenians uh, today, actually, with Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey's actions in the war last year. Um, under the cover of a pandemic, <laughs> no less, and, um, and the continuing acts of aggression that, that are happening now. Um, and their public pronouncements that they will continue um, and work towards completing what the genocide didn't finish in 1915. Um, denial also extends the crime of genocide to future generations of victims, um, those of us who are descendants of genocide survivors and victims uh, obviously continue to suffer uh, the trauma associated with that and denial piles trauma upon trauma. It's a continuation of the intent to destroy the group. Here are some of the tactics, and I'm sure many of you are aware of these, not just in terms of the Armenian genocide, but the Holocaust, Cambodian genocide, Rwanda, um, Native American, you know, people say, oh, was that really a genocide? It was a genocide. So let's face facts and tell it like it is. Use the words that are supposed to be used. They attacked the truth tellers. They committed the crimes, not us. Um, deny or minimize the evidence or, oh, it wasn't that many people, not that big a deal. Uh, deny the genocidal intent, intent, blame natural forces, blame civil or international war. Oh, you know, it happened because war was happening. These things happened during a war. Um, there was no plan, et cetera, et cetera. Blame them, the victims. They were a disloyal minority. Deny the facts. Um, that the facts of this uh, event fit the legal definite definition of genocide. It's pretty clear from the definition I just showed you that it fits that definition. And scholars, historians, governments have recognized that. 
and claimed that the genocide term would harm a peace process and would harm current interests. That's being used right now, actually, um, against the government of Armenia. Um, some acts of denial are anti-free speech laws, which are existent in Turkey right now. Uh, many people have been imprisoned because they used the term genocide when it comes to the Armenians. Threats against foreign governments. This happened recently when um, President Biden uh, was going to recognize the Armenian genocide. Of course, the Turkish president threatened all kinds of action, recalling ambassadors, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the Turkish government just recently did that uh, with 10, 10 countries that um, submitted uh, a letter at re, uh, demanding the release of um, Asman uh, Kabbala, I think is the way you pronounce his name, um, who's been wrongfully imprisoned for many, many years. Um, and they, they're known for um, threats against foreign governments and then backtracking uh, from that. Um, violence against survivors and descendants, that continues to happen in Turkey today. Actually, the Armenian population um, that remained in Turkey continues to suffer um, uh, violent acts, and especially during the war last year, that was extremely evident and, uh, and very disturbing. Revision of history, which has happened in the textbooks in Turkey, and destruction of buildings. And I can actually show you many pictures of the destruction of buildings, but I, I, this, this uh, presentation is uh, pretty focused on the history of the genocide right now. So denial is personal. Um, and the genocide is obviously very personal. Just to uh, tell you who these people are, um, in this picture, the black and white, uh, can you see the point pointer, by the way? Just nod if you can see it. Okay, this person here is my grandmother, Margaret Demanuelian. Um, and um, I see there's a question. Uh, I will answer this right now, and then I'll answer all questions afterwards. Um, did President Biden recognize the Ar Armenian genocide? Yes, he did. Last year on April 24th, um, he recognized the Armenian genocide for what it is and used the word genocide. So thank you for asking the question. And yes, he did. Um, this woman here is my grandmother, Margaret Demanuelian, get Margaret Garabedian Demanuelian. And this is my grandfather, her husband, um, Kiragos Demanuelian. Um, in the Armenian pronunciation, Dermanwelian. And this is her sister, Mariam. And she is the, um, the reason that my grandmother survived <laughs> and made it uh, here. She found my grandmother and um, helped her to escape enslavement, um, which is, I'll tell you a little bit more about her story. And this is a wedding picture of my grandmother and grandfather. And um, as I said, this is very personal. Um, before I talk more about um, my grandmother's story, um, I want to just share one more thing. Um, when we were talking about denial, um, Hitler did use the um, Armenian case as an example. I actually have his quote here. Um, as an example, when encouraging his generals to follow orders and invade Poland and to commit genocide. On August 22nd, 1939, in preparation for the impending invasion on Poland, this is what Hitler said. Our strength consists in our speed and in our brutality. Genghis Khan led millions of women and children to slaughter with premeditation and a happy heart. History sees in him solely the founder of a state. It's a matter of indifference to me what a weak Western European civilization will say about me. I have issued the command and I'll have anybody who utters but one word of criticism executed by a firing squad. That our war aim does not consist in reaching certain lines but in the physical destruction of the enemy. Accordingly, I have placed my death head formations in readiness for the present only in the East, with orders to them to send to death mercilessly and without compassion, 
men, women, and children of Polish derivation and language. Only thus shall we gain the living space which we need. Who, after all, speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? I think that's a very powerful quote, a very powerful example of um, history repeating itself and also mercilessly killing, if you remember the telegram that I showed you from Talat um, earlier in this presentation, um, in this PowerPoint, uh, the language is quite similar. So I think um, one learned well from the other. Uh, Germany was an ally of Turkey during the world during World War One, and in uh, and learned well. Let's just say it that way. Um, the next slide should be. Let's see. Yep. Okay. Hopefully this will work. If it does not, I have an option. But I think I embedded the. Working. Oh, okay. Let me just share a different screen with you. Hold on. Here we go. Hopefully, let me know if you do not hear this, okay? Can you hear it? I could hear it, now I can't hear it. I can't hear the music anymore. Hang on one second. Let me see if I can figure out what's going on. Oh, I see. It's probably because I muted myself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that suggestion. I'm going to keep myself unmuted and hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Okay. Thankfully it was just music so far. to share with you my telling of my great-grandmother, Margaret Garabedian de Manuelian's life. There was a historic Armenian civilization that at one time extended across Anatolia. In 1915, genocide virtually ended this ancient civilization. My great-grandmother, was one of the few to survive. Genocide is the deliberate and systematic destruction in whole or in part of an ethnic, racial, religious, or national group. The Armenian genocide was the first modern genocide. It was a prototype for the Holocaust and set the standard for manipulating new technologies for mass murder. Trains and telegraphs were new and innovative advances that much of the world celebrated. For the Ottoman Turks, such inventions made it possible for them to send orders across the Anatolian plain to round up and execute or deport Armenians. Mass murder made easy. The Armenian genocide began under the cover of World War I. On April 24th, 1915, over 200 Armenian leaders were arrested in Constantinople. Hundreds more were detained in the following weeks. 
They were sent to prison in the interior of Anatolia, where most were executed, and the remaining men were placed in work battalions. This marked the beginning of the genocide. In the months to come, women, children, and the elderly were forced from their homes across Anatolia. They were murdered, abducted, and deported. Most were forced to walk through the desert with no food, clean drinking water, or proper clothing. The majority of Armenians perished in the desert with only a few surviving the extreme conditions forced upon them. Even today, the desert Der El Zor is littered with the bones of Armenians who perished between 1915 and 1918. Those left in Anatolia were forced to leave after the Republic of Turkey was established and the new Turkish leader known as Atatürk, commanded that Anatolia be rid of all Armenians. By 1923, a 3,000-year-old civilization virtually ceased to exist. One and a half million Armenians more than half of the Armenian population in its historic homeland were dead. Despite the affirmation of the Armenian Genocide by historians and governments around the world, the Turkish government still actively denies the Armenian Genocide. Among a series of actions enacted to counter genocide recognition, the government even passed a law in 2004 which makes it a criminal offense to discuss the genocide. Most of the survivors have now passed. Their families still continue to demand recognition for the suffering inflicted upon their beloved ancestors more than 95 years ago. In 1915, my family became the victims of the Armenian Genocide. My great-grandmother was eight years old when the genocide began in Ottoman Turkey. Why did this happen to my people, to my family? and to millions of others across the globe and over the course of human history during other genocides? How can we as humans commit such an unspeakable crime? How can we as humans witness such outrages against our brothers and sisters? These are questions we must try to answer if we want to stop future genocides from occurring. Before I was born, Margaret agreed to have her story recorded. I want to share with you some of her recollections. She lived with her family in the small village Uzunova Mezre in the province of Diyarbakir. In 1915, her entire life changed. <laughs> Çocuklarla 
Her parents, three sisters, and her extended family were murdered. She was abducted into slavery and tortured for years. In 1922, her older sister, the only other survivor from her family, found Margaret and helped her escape. After a long journey, Margaret found her way to Rhode Island with her new husband and child. It was only when she reached Rhode Island that she could slowly begin to build a real life for herself and her family. Armenian folk tales end with the phrase, three apples fell from heaven, one for the storyteller, one for he who listens, and one for he who understands. Margaret told the story. My family and I have listened. Now you have heard the story. Understanding history is our collective responsibility. Remembering the victims of past genocides and by taking action to prevent future genocides from occurring will best measure our commitment. My grandmother, mother, and I are deeply affected by Margaret's experiences and the destruction of our culture. We speak Armenian, go to Armenian church, and try to educate those around us about the Armenian genocide. We want Margaret and all the victims to be remembered, and we want our culture to survive. Most importantly, we hope for the day when no one ever has to suffer what our people endured. With the Armenian Americans of Providence, my family joined together and unveiled a monument to the victims of the Armenian Genocide. The dedication on the memorial reads, we Armenians dedicate this monument to the immortal memory of the 1,500,000 Armenian martyrs massacred by the Turkish government during the 1915 genocide. From this faith, no one can shake us, neither angels nor men, neither sword nor fire, nor water or any blows, however bitter, they be. Battle of Avarair, 451 AD. Okay, I, uh, I stopped sharing my screen so that um, we can, I can talk a little bit more. Um, just a little history behind uh, that video. Um, as you probably figured out, um, my daughter was the narrator. Um, 
Thank you. Um, and uh, we grew up with my at my grandmother's feet. So I'm going to just share a little bit more personally before we get into any questions. That video, by the way, of my grandmother telling her story was taken by my brother. Um, and I needed to do a translation of certain parts of it for the purposes of that video. And it was, um, I have to say, probably one of the most emotional things I've ever had to do. I've heard the story many, many times. I heard her tell it to us. Um, and I knew it from the video that my brother took. But when you're translating it in the first person, it's a very different experience. I felt that I was walking in her shoes and that was very uh, painful. So um, just a little bit more before uh, I open it to questions. So from a young age, um, I have I was involved in my church, youth group, the whole thing. I attended Saturday Armenian school to learn the language, which I do speak uh, relatively fluently. I like to say that my brother and I grew up at our grandparents' knees learning everything from how to make, um, how to bake choreg, which is an Armenian sweet bread, um, to know how to play, uh, to learn how to play backgammon, which is known in tav as tavlu in Armenian, to how to speak the language uh, conversationally, which I, I wanted to learn, so I used to practice with my grandparents. And in this environment, my passion for keeping our culture and history alive grew. For me, the stories passed down from my grandmother, that's my maternal grandmother, by the way, became the impetus for the work that I do now. Um, when my brother and I were growing up, yet yeah, we were involved in our church and organizations, we learned a lot, but we never heard actually the stories of our grandparents' survival until we were in our late 20s. Um, they didn't discuss it. If you, um, I'm sure that you've heard stories, survivors of um, horrific events like a genocide will often uh, just push the horrible memories away in order to build their lives in whatever community they, in their adopted homeland. And in, in our case, we were fortunate that it was the United States. Um, but as we became married adults with children on the way, actually I was pregnant with Dalita when, um, when this video, my brother recorded my grandmother. Um, um, we, she, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Margaret, agreed to tell us her story finally, uh, officially, and have her, have my brother film her. And to this day, I actually consider that video to be one of the greatest gifts my brother's ever given um, our family. Through the video and additional conversations with my grandmother, um, we learn more about how she survived along with her older sister, Mariam. And as you heard, the rest of her family perished in the genocide. So an abbreviated version of her story, a little bit more than what you heard in the video, is that she was between six and eight years old when the genocide began. Because records were, so many records were destroyed after the genocide, um, it's not, we're not able to know exactly how old she was or even her uh, real date of birth. Um, it was obviously all part of the plan to eliminate the Armenians um, or any evidence of the Armenians in the country. But her memories began when the Turkish uh, officials were rounding up the Armenian men to be massacred. And they came to her village that you heard, Uznova and um, uh, Palu, late in the afternoon and they were tossing grenades, looting and burning homes and either murdering the men right there or um, uh, taking them for that purpose. After hiding out with her mother and two younger sisters, first in a gully and then at a Turkish leader's home, her father came out of hiding to see them at the Aga's house. That Aga then betrayed them and the officials came to take her father and two other men who were with him away. And they took them down to the river and slit their throats. That Aga then told the women, my, um, my grandmother's mother and them, that um, some of the men had been shot by the river. And so my grandmother's older sister took her and they went to find their father to see you know, what had happened. And when they got there, they discovered his um, decapitated head. They couldn't tell their mother about that. 
Um, so they lied and said that they didn't find him among the other murdered men. Um, they don't know if their mother believed them or not, but that's what they told her um, because they couldn't bring themselves to say otherwise. After that horror, my grandmother and her mother and four sisters returned to their village to see if they might be safe there. And that's where that story picks up in the video that you just saw. Um, they walked right into the soldiers, gathering up all the women and children into a big barn. And that night, you heard what happened, the raping and abusing. Um, and then the next morning, they lined up the children um, who could walk, the, the children who were old enough to walk, um, and that included my grandmother, uh, against the wall. And that's when she was taken to be a slave uh, in a Turkish household. She never saw her mother and her siblings and three of her sisters again. It is believed that they died on the death marches through the desert. She suffered terrible abuses as a slave for almost 10 years, 10 years before her only surviving older sister discovered her location. And the story of that sister's survival is another one. Um, and I, I, I'll save that for an, another time because it's a, another horrific story. Um, after my grandmother tried to escape several times, after which she was found and severely beaten, they finally hatched a plan, a successful um, escape plan. And then she met my grandmother, my grandfather, Giragos de Manmelian, and they came to the United States Providence in particular by way of Syria and France. Once here, they raised a family, including a son who had been born overseas and three daughters. And that son, their only son died at the age of 21 from illness, um, yet another uh, of so many terrible losses that she had, that they had endured. Obviously this is a sanitized and greatly abbreviated version of her story, but it gives you an idea of what she endured. And um, I'm not quite sure how to explain how it impacted their lives once they were here in Rhode Island, um, because it's hard to say, they needed to obliterate those memories in order to begin their new lives and uh, in, in America. But based on what I recall, um, I know that they had a deep frustration with the continued denial of the events that they themselves had survived um, and endured. And with that, while that anger and frustration did exist, they also wanted and needed to forget. I just remember my grandmother saying with every commemoration of the Armenian genocide that it was like a deep wound being reopened. And uh, I'll end by just saying that that's um, the way it is with continuing denial. And I thank you so much for your attention and for being here. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah, we can. <clears throat> thank you so much, Pauline, for, we can open it up. I wanted to, before I, I meant to thank uh, Gary Brown, for example, who really set this all up and did the Zoom along with Evan Bright, as well as our advisory committee and, you know, all trying to make this kind of a program possible. But mm -hmm. go ahead. People want to ask questions. Uh, I actually, I see some in the, um, I saw actually, Carla, um, honestly, I have to be honest with you. I didn't even know about um, the horrors of the Tulsa massacre until I saw the documentaries myself. So I I, um, I had no idea that your, um, that must have been horrible to find out that your dad had survived that massacre. Um, and uh, yeah, there are a lot of parallels as Dalita said. Um, Christopher, you asked about the Battle of Avaraid um, in 451 um, AD. That references a battle uh, against the Persians in 451 where the um, Armenians were fighting to um, remain, uh, fighting for Christ their Christian faith. Um, against the Zoroastrian Persians at that time. And, um, and they, they actually lost that battle, um, but won the war. And in, uh, um, well, in 301 AD declared Christianity the national religion of Armenia. Oh, very interesting. Thank you for asking. Thank I you. You're welcome. Marsha, oh. yeah. Does somebody have a question? Feel free. Yes, 
I, I wrote it in the chat. I'd like to understand uh, the, what's at the root of this and why the I, Turks chose the Armenians to destroy besides them being a minority. I mean, what what was at the root of, of all this hatred mm -hmm. and uh, why did the Turks feel threatened by the Armenians that they felt they had to destroy them? Well, that's an interesting way of asking the question. Um, also, by the way, um, it wasn't just the Armenians who were persecuted and uh, killed during the, that time. The Greeks and Assyrians were also victims of uh, massacres and, um, and genocide at that time as well. Um, the, the populations were also subjected to the same types of massacres, killings, horrific um, uh, experiences. Um, it's very difficult to explain the root uh, cause of the genocide. Um, um, I'm not sure to... So it's that the othering, right? So if we think about us and them and um, the perceived threat of a very small minority who were in Russia at the time might have been one of the reasons that they used. But ultimately, I think the reason was that there was an ultra, um, ultra natu uh, extreme nationalist movement um, for tur Turkification of very similar to H Hitler's plan um, with Germany. I think there's a very similar reasoning in that way. Um, so I would I would go back to that as probably a root cause of of this. And Armenians were not, um, you know, ethnically considered Turkish. Um, they were a Christian minority. Um, and Howard asked the. Um, Religion yeah, I wanted, intolerant. I wanted to ask about the, the role of religion. You mentioned the importance of the church uh, for you and your family. And I wonder whether this was a, the part of, uh, aside from the older nationalism, whether, whether that sure. had played a part in, your, in sure. the discrimination. Sure, sure. I would say that certainly played a part, um, you know, in the way that religion can play a part in any of these types of, uh, of genocidal actions, right? Um, uh, some again, many similarities to uh, the Holocaust in that in that regard. But the Armenians, the Greeks, the Assyrians were all Christian minorities in um, a primarily Muslim region, and I would I would say that probably was a another um, another factor in the genocide. Um, Robin asked why. Um, why our, my grandparents actually decided to come to Providence. Um, I think there was uh, there were relatives here who had also made it to this part of um, the country and to this uh, state in particular. Uh, and so they, they sort of came to where my grandfather's family, um, some of his uh, cousins uh, were here and I believe an uncle were also here. So I, that's, I think the primary reason why they chose to come to Providence and I'm grateful that they did, <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much why. Um, I do have an email. I can, uh, I'll put it right in here. I'm gonna put my, my Armenian weekly email in here. You can use that one to reach me. Um, Thank you, Joanne, for that. Manya said the common denominator was that we were all Christians. Um, and Dalita said, scapegoated for it. The issue is already existing in the Ottoman Empire, correct? Part of what led to the othering. Um, and the Kurds were also brutal in their participation in the Armenian genocide. Um, yes, my family did, Manya, um, talk about uh, the Kurdish brutality, they actually, um, the government used the Kurdish tribes actually in their plan. When they were on the death, when the Armenians were on the death marches, um, the Turks uh, essentially, um, I don't want to use the word ordered, but opened up the, the, the death marches to the Kurdish tribes to, um, for lack of better terminology, rape and pillage. Um, and uh, and there was a great deal of brutality there. And since then, 
the Kurds have um, discovered that they are now a minority in Turkey and are subject to many of the same, much of the same treatment. So um, there's, you know, this consistent history uh, of human rights violations in, um, in Turkey that continue to this day, particularly under the current leadership. It wasn't always that way, but particularly under the current leadership. Um, yeah. can, you, can you mention how Armenia, can we talk about the Kurds, the Kurds still do not have their own country. Armenia no. does have their own country. So can yes. you talk a little bit about how that eventually did, it, did happen? Yeah, sure. Maybe the same way the, the Jews, you know, the Jewish population eventually got, you know, their own country was Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, the Armenians um, immediately following the genocide were able to uh, sort of um, start a first independent Republic of Armenia um, from the vestiges of and survivors of the horrors of the Armenian genocide. It was uh, a very short-lived um, independent Republic from 1918 to 1920. Um, and uh, ultimately was swallowed up in the Soviet Union at that time. And much like a huge swath of area was uh, swallowed up by the Soviet Union. So Armenia did not exist um, as an independent republic again until 1991 with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, so from 1918 to 1920, there was a very brief period of independence. Um, many, many, many of the Armenians um, during that time were racked with illness, um, Typhus was uh, very, was rampant. Um, and of course there was just uh, great poverty, um, but yet a great determination to have a homeland, to have an independent homeland. And because of that, because of that first Republic of Armenia, there is now a, an independent Republic of Armenia in that same region. Um, and with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, they were able to declare independence again in 1991, thankfully. Um, you're welcome, Marsha. Thank you for your attention. Um, the latest conflict. <laughs> I like the quotes around that. Um, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, I will spend just a very brief amount of time on that, but uh, last year, um, Azerbaijan decided to um, attack again under the conditions of a pandemic um, and a world shut down by it essentially uh, to attack the Armenian um, uh, Republic of Artsakh, primarily inhabited by Armenians, its native Armenian land for centuries and, um, and so, uh, and actually beyond. Um, and so the Armenians were forced to defend themselves, but throughout the course of that 44 day so-called war, um, many, many, many people were lost and about 75% or thereabouts, more than half of the um, Armenian part of the Republic of Artsakh were taken uh, by Azerbaijan, which is was assisted by Turkey and um, mercenaries that were hired by Turkey to fight on behalf of Azerbaijan. So that's what has happened and continues actually in, on November 9th, it will be the anniversary of the signing of a a trilateral ceasefire agreement brokered by Russia um, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And um, we will see what happens. There have been continuing attacks now on sovereign Armenian land in the southwestern part of Armenia. Um, and it, that continues to this day. It's um, very disturbing. Uh, very traumatizing for Armenians to see this continuing to happen um, in 2021. Uh, the uh, our Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani and Turkish presidents have both publicly announced that they intend to complete what they started with the genocide. Um, they consider themselves um, 
one nation, two states. They use that uh, slogan often. And Armenia is right smack in the middle of these two countries um, who want to essentially wipe Armenia off the face of the map. Carla, you have your hand raised. Am I seeing that correctly? Do you have a question? Okay. Oh, hi. Oh, I can't hear you. You you muted yourself again. There you go. Hi, thank you so much for your work and sharing with us here today. Um, I'm just very moved hearing all about it. And, um, you know, I saw a film, uh, it's a 2016 film, I just Googled it, The Promise. And I mm -hmm. believe that's the only film that ever portrayed this tragic part of history. Are there other films that you know of that you recommend? And, and what did you think of that film? Um, I thought that film was, uh, was well done. I, um, I thought it provided a, a relatively a uh, good overview of what happened in the genocide. Obviously it was a work, it was a film. It was fictional um, in many ways with a, a, a historical undertone and background. Um, it was, you know, films like this um, are difficult to make. Uh, any film about any genocide is very difficult to make because it's a very brutal act. Um, in during uh, World War I, um, the method of killing was, uh, you know, different than it was than it was in World War II. And equally, I would say, you know, the method of killing really didn't matter. The, the, the whole intent was what mattered. And I think they did a good job in the promise. What I liked also with the promise is that they actually have uh, curriculum materials so that if if teachers want to use it um, in their classrooms, they can do that. It's really well done in that regard. Um, there are other, there was one other film called Ararat. Um, quite honestly, uh, whenever a film has been uh, discussed being made, uh, the there's a great deal of pressure put on um, Hollywood and the filmmakers against having it made. The, the Turkish lobby is very, very strong um, and they tend to succeed in that regard, unfortunately. So, um, you know, there are other films that have been, uh, that have been made documentary style films and I can, um, maybe what I'll do is provide a list of some um, films and, and literature uh, for, um, BCC and and um, and they can provide that information. Also, if you go to the Genocide Education Project website, you will also find that. Um, let me just double check that website, and I can drop it in the um, in the chat for anybody who's interested. I just want to make sure I put the right one in there um, so that it's not incorrect. Thank you for your question, Carl. I appreciate it. Oh, let me see here. Hmm. It's taking a while to link to. Are you doing that, Pauline? Did did any uh, nation come um, offer support for uh, the establishment of Armenia in its uh, first? In the first country? republic. Yeah. Um, I don't know that there was any. I mean, there was a world that was that was dealing with a world war at that time. No, I don't believe that any of that. Although there was uh, during Versailles, no, I'm not during the Versailles, you know, the negotiation that must have come up. It did. It did. I was actually going to talk. I'm not um, a historian, so I don't profess to know all of the the historical um, background behind the treaty um, and and how that turned out. But I do know that the First Republic um, in some documentation was recognized as an independent republic. So it was not, France has always been extremely um, supportive of the Republic of Armenia as a nation, for, as from the national perspective. Um, I would say that's probably the most notable uh, country to offer support to Armenia at that time in particular. Uh, beyond that, I'm not quite sure about the you know, uh, an actual national support for um, for the, the First Republic of Armenia in 1918. Thank you for asking, though. I can find out for you, Howard, if you'd like. 
and I'm going to drop this link into the um, chat regarding the Genocide Education Project. That's the link. If you would like information, there's all kinds of um, information about uh, books and film uh, material that you can access there. Pauline, I was just curious uh, as to how the Spanish flu, it must have been around the same time, how that yeah. affected that event. You know, it's funny, la um, not funny, haha, -ha, but interesting. Last year, I was thinking the same thing and wondering the same thing. I'm sure it had an impact, especially in 1918, as you said. At that point, the um, the the bulk of the, the genocidal plan had been carried out, although it did continue until 1923 um, with, you know, additional massacres. Um, but I'm sure that that flu also had an impact along with typhus um, in the decimation of the surviving population. So I'm, I'm, I can only imagine that has never really been investigated or discussed, quite frankly. I haven't heard anything about that. It's, uh, it's very interesting to me. But um, yes, there were many, many, many people who died from uh, the Spanish flu. Joanne said 50 million people around the world died. So I'm sure that that had an impact on wh whoever survived, whoever was able to survive the first uh, three years of the genocide. Turkey recognized Armenia at the Treaty of Seb. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When, when was that? 1918? Manya, do you know? Was it 1918 at that time? Very briefly. Um, 1920, right. That would be strange that they would have recognized it, given that they were trying to wipe them out. Yes, yes, but yes. There was probably some political reason. For well, that. yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> As there always is. Yes, yes, definitely. Well, ultimately, there was no Armenia at that point. Uh, uh, by um, at some point in 1920, 1921, it was a part of the Soviet Union right. at that point. During all those years, while they were part of the Soviet Union, they were able to remain retain their autonomy to some extent, I assume. Um, not so much, really. It was a, a communist country at that point, and there was very little. Um, there was maybe a, a, a little bit of autonomy, uh, as with all the Soviet republics at right, that right, time, right. Um, but not not a great deal. And certainly, there was no religious freedom. There was no, right. you know, none of that. So, the people during the time of the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a great change in terms of um, uh, a, a great change in the the culture of Armenia during the Soviet years, uh, the, the culture and the faith of Armenia. Um, thank you, Howard. Thank you. Um, and yes, Stalin did give a lot of Armenia to Azerbaijan. Definitely. Right. That was, yeah, more, right. yet yeah, more that happened right. at that time. Are there any other questions? questions? If, if not, um, again, thank you so much, Pauline, for this. Obviously, uh, people were very moved and I think learned thank something uh, that maybe we didn't know and something for us to build on as usual. And so, thank yeah, you. If, you, if you want to provide us with a list or whatever, I'll, I'll distribute that and we'll put it on our website. Sure, I'll be happy to do that. I will, um, I'll uh, put a list together for you and I'll provide it to you. Um, I really thank you, Manya. I thank, I thank all of you for being here and for participating in this presentation and for your care and your interest. Um, it means a great deal. And I'm happy to um, proceed from here if you, um, if you have any further need and it would be great if we could do this in person at some point uh, yeah well I think, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. but hopefully um, that'll happen again <laughs> <laughs> yeah hopefully next semester yeah, that would be great we'll, we'll be in person i don't know about this program but we'll be doing it thank um, you colleen i like that chinoda galutun means thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank You're you uh, thank everybody for uh, for attending and um
we um, look for the, um, you, you go to our Facebook to register for our um, next program, or we'll also have a flyer available as well. So, um, okay. So thank you again. Thank everybody. Thank you, Gary, for your work, help. Thank you, Gary. Work. Thank you, Ron. Thank, thank you all Gary. very much. Thank you, thank Carol, you. for letting us know about Tulsa too. That was important. Yes. Thank you, Carla. I'm sorry that that yeah. happened to your